nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll call our commission meeting to order. And uh, we have no proclamations today, but we have a presentation. It is uh, one we have annually, and it's the Lakeland Regional Health Update. And Danielle Drummond, the um, Lakeland Regional Health President and CEO, is going to make that. And welcome, Danielle. Thank you for being here. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's really a privilege and honor to be able to share with you uh, some updates uh, about our health system and uh, what we're looking forward to as uh, we move ahead. So just a little bit about uh, Lakeland Regional Health. You know, we obviously have a long legacy of providing um, much needed healthcare services to this community. And I can just say, um, now that I have completed uh, just about uh, 10 months as the president and CEO, that it has really been, uh, you know, just an honor and a privilege for me to be able to lead this amazing team through such unprecedented times this past year and really, uh, you know, firm up our commitment to this community. And I really am looking forward to hopefully uh, getting COVID in the rearview mirror um, and be able to focus on some of the exciting uh, growth and development opportunities that we've outlined uh, as we look ahead uh, for the organization. So um, it is nice uh, to be spending some time with you, I'm not focused on COVID, uh, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions should you have any um, as we move through the presentation on that. But I was really hoping to be more forward looking um, in our time together today. Um, so just a little bit about us. Uh, we are the fifth largest hospital in Florida at 864 beds. Becker's actually released on Friday their rankings of uh, the national sizes of hospitals, and we're actually 44th in the country, which I think is very impressive uh, when you, uh, you know, think about our community to um, have such a large um, institution uh, to be able to meet the healthcare needs um, of Lakeland and the surrounding communities. As you know, we have one of the busiest emergency departments um, in the country, and I'll circle back to that a little bit later when I talk about our plans uh, to become a teaching hospital and increase access uh, to much needed primary care services, uh, which will again help to, help to address that issue. While we're very proud of our busy emergency department, it also speaks to some underlying access issues um, in our community. We're the only trauma center in Polk County, uh, level two trauma center, um, but really extremely busy trauma service and you know, pleased to be able to provide uh, that uh, much needed healthcare access uh, to all of those in Polk County and surrounding communities. Uh, we're home to the Banish Institute for Advanced Rehabilitation Medicine, and that has been a great success uh, for our organization. That unit is uh, you know, generally full and really serves as that next step in the care continuum for patients that are with us for their acute care services. Uh, the Carol Jenkins Barnett Pavilion for Women and Children opened its doors in 2018, and once again, that has been just a tremendous success. Houses a level three NICU, which was new for our community previously. Uh, those um, moms and children would have to travel uh, to Tampa or Orlando for that level of care. And that NICU is 30 beds, and I can tell you on any given day, uh, our census is in the high 20s. So it's definitely been a much needed service here. Yeah. We've also been experiencing a little bit of a baby boom um, at the medical center, and I think uh, you know across the country, um, and have uh, really been welcoming a record number of babies uh, into the world um, at that facility. Um, you know, anywhere from 350 to 300. 75 um, babies a month um, have been uh, welcomed into the world in our facility, which is great. Uh, the Hollis Cancer Center, uh, very proud of that uh, facility as well. The faculty there just do an amazing job providing uh, life-saving care um, each and every day. And then lastly, the Jack and Tina Harrell Family Institute for Advanced Cardiovascular Medicine uh, has continued to grow and evolve um, those services and capabilities and very proud of the physicians that practice um, in that center of excellence, both from uh, the Lakeland Regional Health Physician Group as well as the Watson Clinic. And then a little bit just about our organization and the impact. You know, we have over 6,000 team members. Uh, we're the second largest employer in Polk County. I'll talk a little bit about our economic impact on the next slide. We have uh, close to 300 uh, employed providers within our physician group. So that's a combination of physicians and advanced practitioners. And we have uh, 10 uh, locations across the community to be able to meet the needs. And then you can see on the right side uh, some of the designations and awards we've gotten for the centers of excellence that I just noted. And then we recently completed an economic impact analysis to show uh, the impact that Lakeland Regional Health does have on uh, the local community. So in addition to providing those much needed health care services, you can see from this slide, we also have a significant impact um, in the way of jobs and uh, finances um, for all of the services that we provide, not only with our team members, but then for also all of the services um, that we rely upon and the suppliers and contractors um, in our area. And we really look forward to continuing this growth um, as we move to the future. 
And one of the key uh, elements and programs that I'll be happy uh, to really officially announce and share with you today um, is related to our plans for graduate medical education. So if we take a step back and look at some of these great capabilities, you know, we're one of the largest hospitals in the country that does not teach uh, physician residents. And we really feel that we're missing out on the opportunity to contribute to that learning of the next generations of physicians. Moreover, we know from looking at the top ranked hospitals in the country that they are all teaching hospitals. So we really feel confident that the infusion of these new residents, the faculty, and the research and education that it brings will allow us to even further uh, the work that we do in these uh, various clinical services. And then there's the access. So I talked a bit about uh, you know, our high visit emergency department, which is not ideal. And it really speaks to the fact that we are underserved. So the third and really most, um, I think, important thing for us to consider as we look at the rollout of this graduate medical education program is it will greatly increase the access to healthcare services for those in our community that really need it the most. As I mentioned, one of the largest hospitals to not have training we know that we provide a large amount of uh, charity care uh, for those that are not able uh, to afford uh, their health care services today. When we look at the number of primary care and mental health providers in Polk County, you can see from a primary care perspective, we have one provider for just over 2,000 individuals in our community. If you compare us to Florida and Hillsborough County, you can see that that is drastically lower, almost half. So they're closer to 1,000 um, individuals per primary care provider. So clearly we have an access challenge uh, based on the number of providers uh, that we have here currently. And then a similar story in mental health. We're about one per 1,000, whereas uh, looking at the state of Florida and Hillsborough County, that number is closer to 500. So we have a huge gap that we need to fill. And by rolling out a number of teaching programs, we will be able to meet these needs because the medical residents will be able to see these patients in the training environment. And then hopefully they will choose to stay and practice in this community um, as they graduate um, and move on to their permanent positions in the medical field. So I'm happy to share that we are planning to launch our graduate medical education program on July 1st, 2023. We've been working um, on this for many years, as many of you know, and really happy to be able to have cleared a number of the uh, hurdles that were in our way to be able to bring 190 residents across eight programs uh, to this community. You can see on the slide uh, here and on the next couple slides, I'll share with you a number of these faculty are already here in this community. So they'll both practice within the Lakeland Regional Health Physician Group, but also uh, be leading up uh, these uh, graduate education <coughs> training <coughs> programs. First is Dr. Finnegan. She is the designated institutional officer, which essentially is the physician that is over all of our GME um, efforts. She's also acting as our interim internal medicine program director um, as we uh, work to recruit for that position. That will be actually based across the street from the hospital at our current family health center and will allow us to be able to see patients both in the outpatient and inpatient setting uh, for the residents as a part of that training program. Dr. Finnegan's a nephrologist and she's also seeing patients here locally. In addition, uh, we'll be starting a psychiatry program. You can see Dr. Aline is the program director for that. This will be housed in our new behavioral health hospital, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the presentation. We'll also have an emergency medicine uh, training program. Dr. Barbera is here and on board already working in our emergency department and obviously having one of the busiest emergency departments in the country will be a great training ground uh, for the <coughs> next generation of emergency medicine physicians, seeing patients both in the adult um, and the pediatric emergency departments on our main campus. The other programs that we'll be launching include family medicine, OBGYN, general surgery, and a transitional year, as well as a surgical critical care fellowship. Transitional year is essentially a one-year uh, window where a resident that's coming out of, say, internal medicine and trying to determine if they would like to go on into a specialty service would have the opportunity uh, to spend some time um, with us and determine where they want to take that next uh, step on their specialty training path. So very excited uh, to be able to, to offer that in addition to all of these uh, defined specialties. And you can see um, the faculty that we've already hired, uh, Dr. Davis for general surgery is already here um, and practicing and starting uh, to help us build that program. The other three um, have contracts and will be joining us um, over the course of the next several months. So this is uh, you know, very real. The, the timeline will be upon us very quickly. Uh, with the July 1st, 2023 start, uh, we'll be um, actually interviewing for residents then in the fall of 2022. So around this time next year, uh, we'll really be in the throes of building that. 
It'll be a five year uh, cap building window. So that's what's been uh, determined as the window of time we have from when we start until we'll have our final number, which again, we're targeting to be 190. So each year uh, we will be working up towards that 190 uh, total resident count as we move forward. And then with this GME addition, um, our economic impact grows um, even greater. So you can, as you can imagine, the 190 residents being here will have a significant impact. The faculty additions that I just talked about, there'll be a number of new administrative positions as well uh, that we'll be recruiting for uh, to be able uh, to support this. And then again, our hope is that not only will there be a lot more activity over the course of the training, but also that a number of these individuals will get to know and love our institution and our community as much as we do and really choose to stay here and practice which again will help us with some of those long-term deficits in the uh, care providing uh, arena that I shared previously. So very excited uh, to not only improve the overall quality of care and access to care, but also to be able to contribute uh, to the economic impact here uh, locally in our community. And then the last topic I wanted to cover, um, if, and if you've driven by uh, the hospital campus recently, you've seen uh, the, the great progress uh, that is underway on our Center for Behavioral Health and Wellness. Uh, we plan to open the doors uh, to this uh, state-of-the-art facility late summer of next year, so we are moving right along. Uh, we've been very fortunate. Our team has done an amazing job managing a lot of the challenges of this past year and a half, but we still are on budget and on time for completion of this much-needed uh, facility here in our community. Just to remind you a little bit about the scope of services that will be provided here, 96 inpatient beds. Uh, that is compared to our current licensed bed count of 68 beds, but due to some of the physical capability constraints that we deal with every day, I'd say our typical capacity today is really closer to 60. So this is gonna be a significant increase in the number of inpatients we'll be able to care for. You can see the breakout here. We'll continue to offer um, child and adolescent um, capabilities within that facility, specialty beds for those patients that have both medical and behavioral health diagnoses. That is a growing population today that we're caring for within our main hospital and wanted to make sure we had those same capabilities in this new facility. And then we'll have 72 adult beds that will be used for a variety um, of purposes as well. We'll be able to house our physician and outpatient space in the same building, which will be great. It will allow us to be much more efficient and have much more uh, coordination in the continuity of care, which will be a, a huge improvement over our, our dispersed model that we have in place today. Treatment areas for a number of new programs that I'll touch upon outpatient program and classroom space for education and therapy and to be able to provide more to those in our community um, as well, which uh, again, I'll touch upon in a moment, has been uh, very well received and much needed. There'll be a gym and an uh, activity area, we'll have a secure intake area, and the building in total is 80,000 square feet. At the same time, while the buildings have been going up, we've actually been continuing to grow our program in our existing space. Um, so through the addition of some new providers, we've actually seen an 81% increase in the number of outpatient visits just this past year alone. We currently have 900 patient visits per month, but unfortunately, I would say to you, if you called looking for an appointment, it's still gonna take you a few months to get in. So it just goes to show that despite the growth that we've been seeing, it's still not enough. We know that this is a service that has a lot of unmet need, as I demonstrated um, you know, on the previous slide with the shortage in the number of providers. And this new space will allow us to continue to recruit and expand those services uh, across the community. This is one area where COVID was helpful because it really forced us to be more into the telehealth offering in behavioral health services. And this is an area where we found that I think it's here to stay. I think that telehealth will be utilized in behavioral health um, in the you know, foreseeable future. And it's actually been helpful in some instances for patients uh, to have more consistency in being able to keep their appointments and for the provider to be able to see uh, the patient's home environment, um, which is helpful to them as well as they work with that particular individual. Uh, this slide just shows some of the other technologies and programs that we're rolling out, and then also um, you know, working to provide uh, more uh, peer support programs with uh, community partners uh, within our four walls to really support those that are coming to us uh, for their care. And then some things that we have under development. Um, I would say if you look at our services today, we're sort of on the, the two extremes. We obviously have this high level acute care service that we provide, and then we have physician office visits, but we really don't have a lot of the services in between. So there's a huge opportunity for us to be able to provide more intensive outpatient programs as well as partial hospitalization. So patients may come to us um, all day, but then they can go home at night and just come back the next morning. So they don't necessarily need to stay with us, but they still need that more intense level of service and treatment than we're able to offer today. This new facility will have the physical space that will allow us to be able to provide services such as that uh, to this community. 
And then we're really leaders in the community as well as the state um, and the region on this particular topic. Um, a number from our team have been invited to serve on uh, various task force, the Florida Hospital Association, uh, Polk Vision, and really leading the effort um, as we are able to share what we've learned and help to map out uh, the future as we all work to be able to fill the void on this much needed uh, service uh, for those that we serve both locally um, and across the state and the nation. I think clearly uh, COVID has highlighted uh, you know, the need for us to continue to make investments in this space uh, so that we can support those uh, that are struggling with behavioral health issues and to really work to break the stigma um, associated with that as we move ahead as well. So that was all I had for my prepared remarks. Um, again, just a very appreciative of the opportunity to be here today and of the city's support of all the great work. I'm uh, just thrilled to be able to move forward with some of these projects and programs that have been a long time um, in the making and would be happy to answer any questions that you may have today. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I know the GME side particularly is extremely exciting to me. Interesting why the 190 cap as opposed to 215 or some other number? Sure, uh, good question, I'd say. It was sort of a moving uh, you know, number that we just sort of landed on at this point in time. Every program is different, so while internal medicine you know, will have dozens of uh, residents, surgery is only gonna have a few. So as we sort of mapped out what we thought our organization uh, was best optimized to be able to handle so that we could fully support the needs, 190, when we sort of added them all up across the eight programs was where we landed. Again, that number might be a little variable as, as we move ahead but we really tried to be thoughtful and say, for this particular program, how many residents do we think our institution can support and do it in the right way? And 190 was where we landed. Perfect. Commissioner McCarla. Um, two things. At first, so excited about the behavioral health piece. I did a ride along with LPD a couple weeks ago, and I think the first re responders that you mentioned is just kudos to that and to helping our first responders as much as possible. We're, <coughs> they obviously are on the front lines of behavioral health. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to support that. Second piece is since 2012, when I joined Polk Vision, the GME has just been at the forefront of the discussions that we had, even through my Randy Roberts Foundation, working with Congress and CMS and all those different things and the need just for the community at large. The more primary care physicians that we can have throughout Polk County, the better off we will be, um, and in behavioral health as well. So the fact that we're finally to a point, we were limited just to give you historical perspective by CMS to have three interns. Um, and so 190 compared to three is like, whoa, like that's just so exciting and, I, and it's hard for me to contain my exciting, excitement and kudos to that. Um, but with regard to the GME, we know that education is the backbone of our economy as well and so retaining these primary care physicians, I think the onus is on us as a commission to underpin and support you know, the education system so that these doctors as they come here and build their families and want to stay, that they have an education opportunity for their students. Um, and our magnet program obviously is a waiting list and a lot of them apply for that. What can we do as a city commission to help you continue to recruit, recruit the best people possible, and support you in that endeavor? Absolutely. I think, you know, as we're very excited to have all the building blocks in place, you know, on the, on the health system side, I would agree. I think the ability to sell Lakeland as a community is going to be critical. So I think the more that we can, you know, work with you all with regards to, you know, how do we want to um, position the community? What are those things that are really important for them to feel like this is home? You know, a lot of them are coming at a time in their lives where, you know, maybe they're not married or they don't have a family when they first arrive, but by the time they complete their training, they might. So I think there's going to be a broad spectrum that we need to consider. And I think it's everything from, you know, housing and um, social networks, education, as you mentioned, um, you know, the, the religious, um, you know, avenues that we're able to make sure that they're aware of so that they really can feel that connection to Lakeland and feel like it is home and where they want to stay and, and build their practice in their career. Because again, the ability to have access during the training aspects to these uh, programs will be important. But I think the more that we can also attract and retain uh, these physicians, regardless of who they want to join, which practice in the, in the community, but just their willingness and desire to stay here is going to be critical. So yes, I would you know, love to continue the, the dialogue with you all with regards to all the great plans we have going on at the city to make sure that we're able to use that as we are working to, to sell the community to these residents too. Mm -hmm. Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Danielle, for that update. It's exciting news. I echo the comments about the graduate medical education. I know that's been in the works and a lot of people have worked hard on that for many years and that's exciting for the hospital as well as for our city. I know this isn't a COVID update and it is encouraging as you and I were talking before the meeting just to hear some of the, the plans and the things that you all have on the horizon. But as we hopefully come out of 
uh, the, the peak of the COVID season and all that has happened in the past year. And thank you to you and your entire team, the nurses, the doctors, the people on the front lines for all that they have done for this city over the past year. What would you say are some of the, the main challenges that you all face now as we look into next year and into the future? Yeah, great question. I mean, obviously, we're all hopeful um, that the you know the worst is, is behind us. It's been a, uh, certainly not a, a journey or a path I was able to predict. So um, I'll definitely put that caveat in there. It threw a, several curveballs my way and, and the team's way. I think just with the uncertainty of how these you know ups and downs have occurred. Um, but I am hopeful um, as we go into the, the winter months that you know the, the worst is behind us. But again, that will remain to be seen. I think it's just knowing that we do have though still a lot of patients uh, that require care. So how do we work to make sure that we're continuing to provide? you know, the best possible care, ensure that we have, um, you know, enough uh, care team members to be able to provide, you know, that care. Obviously, our team has done an amazing job over the last, you know, almost two years now, but it's been exhausting, you know, work for them. So I think just continuing to do what we can do to support them and make sure that we're keeping a robust team in place uh, will be important. And then just working to make sure we're continuing to meet the needs of the community. I talk, you know, a lot about the access in primary care and behavioral, which is very important, but there's also many other services that we want to continue to to grow and develop here locally so that no resident has to leave the area for their health care needs. They should be able to um, access what they need at a facility as large as ours. So that's really going to be a, a continued strategic um, effort and focus for us as we move ahead. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and good morning. Good morning. Sorry for being a little tardy, but thank you for always coming to provide us an update on what's going on at uh, Lake Regional Health and mentioning so our residents would not have to leave a outside of Lakeland to, to have the particular care they need to have. And speaking of a couple of entities coming into our community, yes. uh, could you give me your take on, on how you, th you look at that and, and how that may play out, especially with the growth of Lakeland and how our community continue to expand, grow, population grow, needs of, uh, or whatever health uh, situations are may, uh, expand as well? Sure. Um, yes, obviously, it, Lakeland's a growing area. I know it's a desirable market um, you know, for expansion. And when the certificate of need went away uh, back in 2019, you know, we anticipated that there would be new entrants um, into this market. So I think what we're continuing to work on, though, is to make sure that we can provide those necessary health care services. We've been in this community for over 100 years and want to make sure that we're providing all the services, you know, not just, you know, those that are maybe going to be the most profitable, but rather those that are really much needed here. We are the safety net provider. Provider. So we're definitely staying strong to those things, such as you know, behavioral health and uh, some of the other services that are uh, not going to be as maybe financially attractive, but are really much needed services here locally. So we'll continue on that front. And I think just given our size and the capabilities that we have, we know that we're going to be able to continue to provide those higher level uh, services and care uh, for this community. So I think the, the work that we're doing in GME will be critical to that because I think that additional infrastructure and care providers at the bedside will allow us to continue on on that path as we move ahead. So yes, you know, again, competition, you know, kind of is what it is. We know that, uh, you know, we'll need to be prepared for it, but I feel strongly that our strategic plans and all of the um, you know, things that we've laid out as we move into the future will position us well to continue to provide the healthcare services to this community that are needed. And good to hear that because I think uh, our citizens need to know that, you know, the, what we call our hospital mm -hmm. has been around how many ever years, as you say, 100 years plus, and, and knowing that uh, what we're doing to support whatever their particular health needs may be, we have it right here as well and have had it mm -hmm. and will continue to have and be strong in delivering the kind of services we need to have. So thank you, Ms. Drummer. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and I think the, you know, again, I, the other comment I would just add is, I think when you look at the size and the capabilities, obviously it does, you know, it, it is something to uh, consider with regards to some of these emergency services. So I think having a, you know, very right. robust stroke team and uh, chest pain team, et cetera, does allow right. us to be able to provide excellence in the outcomes for the patients that come to us for that type of care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One last question, staffing needs. Um, yep. During this whole period of time and having to bring in a lot of people from the outside as well as you felt, just give us kind of a scope of what you see happening now and in the next three or four years. Sure. Um, you may have seen the Florida Hospital Association recently uh, released a sobering uh, projected shortage for nurses in the state of Florida that was uh, around 59,000, uh, you know, over the next 10 years or so. So we um, certainly, uh, you know, need to make sure that we're doing our part to um, support the, the training and, uh, you know, recruitment of the next generation of nurses. So I, I think it is certainly a concern across all hospital leaders at this point in time, not just in Florida, but around the country. 
Um, recognizing where we're located, though, I think we're going to have particular um, strain just because we know the, the growth and the demand for health care services will continue to grow here locally. So we're continuing to work very closely with the local schools um, and educational institutions to say, what role can we play? How can we think outside the box and do things differently than we have in the past? Um, what role can our nurse leaders play in really providing more in the educational space and allowing more access to those that are in nursing programs to be able to spend time within our institution in ways that they hadn't in the past from the conversations we've had? Some of those areas are rate limiting factors for them with regards to how many nursing students they might be able to have in their program. So uh, I look forward to continuing to work with our nursing leadership as well as the, the local schools so that we can really think outside the box um, relative to that. I think we're fortunate where we're located that we do have so many great schools around us that we can partner with um, as we look forward. But I don't think doing the, doing it the way we've always done it in the past is going to allow us to, to meet the need. I think we're really going to have to think about it differently than we have previously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your report. If you think Danielle talks fast, she thinks faster. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're doing Thank an you. excellent yep, job. Appreciate, we appreciate it. it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation we'll have is Lake Craig Oves AIA Honor Award, and Bob Donahue is going to make that presentation. Mr. Donahue, thank you for being here. And your phone light is on, so <laughs> just for battery purposes. Good morning, Commission. Uh, Good morning. Mayor, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're actually, we just want to thank, uh, if John Kirk would come up along with Pam Page. Pam, you don't get to sit down and hide this morning. Uh, <laughs> see, I didn't even see her sitting there. She's hidden so well. Yes, she, she was trying, I'm sure. Yes. Um, the, the, we would like to recognize John Kirk and Lake Craig Oak Park uh, for receiving the very prestigious AIA Honor Award. And if you go, you got to go up to the front. Here we go. <laughs> She's trying to hide. She's trying her best. But I just want to, the AIA American Institute of Archite Architects recognizes and celebrates the best building and spaces in the firms and designers behind them. The Tampa Bay chapter held their awards over the weekend and Lake Crago was recognized. Honor Awards recognize projects that demonstrate the highest standards of design and innovation and a commitment to excellence in architectural design. This year, the Honor Award was awarded to John Kirk and Lake Crago Outdoor Recreation Center. Uh, definitely want to thank you so very much. John does several projects for us. He's got a couple on the books right now. And if John Kirk is 1A, well, Pam Page is like 1A and a half. <laughs> together as a team, it's just been a pleasure to work with them every day, watch them collaborate on all of our projects, and they're just always in tune, always in step, and we get the best bang for our buck. Lake Crago is a 12,000 square foot recreation center uh, with a large rental room for 200 people, uh, catering ki kitchen, uh, two meeting rooms, a, ba a boathouse, and a gorgeous dock on Lake Crago itself. It also has a, a dog park, boat ramps, and restrooms, but it's talking bang for your buck and per square foot price, and when you factor all those things in, the amount that we paid for the building and what we did out there is just phenomenal, and these two people took the lead and we appreciate it so very much and congratulations. Mayor, would you come up? You know, when you think about what that could have looked like and just been normal, that's what most places would have done. Neither of these people think that way. No, they don't. And, and, and so the arts centric look of things, the ability to have it be different from the way uh, most places, even the boathouse. Look at the boathouse. Is that the house you would typically see? Yes. Not at all. And so no. thank you so much for that. Any comments? Well, I would like to just say, you know, for years, the Parks and Rec Department has always done a fantastic job in all of the parks they do. And so for me to just be a part, a small part of this, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. But then also just being able to take their vision, they've had the vision for years, and to be able to craft that into a facility that I think will serve the residents of Lakeland for a long time coming, I'm just thankful. So thank you for the opportunity. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> John, um, we just love working with you. You're so creative, and you take our programs and just make them zing, and Everyone is completely different and unique, and we just look forward to future projects working with you. Thank you. 
to let you know how much he liked the facility that was developed, his daughter got married in it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> was that was the our, first we wedding in there? I think it was the third. Third wedding, yeah. third, yeah. it was very close. Yeah. So. Whatever. And of course, humble John didn't bring you a ward. Whatever, so y'all just get the, if you just stand together and then that's the best we can do. It's Thank who you so he much. Is. It's who he is. We're gonna take a picture of that. Yes, Come on please. Up. Please, Bob. All right, that brings us to our committee reports and Commissioner McLeod, who's our Finance Committee Chairman, is gonna make that presentation. Thank you, Mayor. The Finance Committee met on November 12th in the City Commission Conference Room. Commissioner McLeod, Chair, and Mayor Bill Mutz, member, were present. Commissioner Music, member, was absent. Commissioners Philip Walker, Bill Reed, Stephanie Madden were also present. City Manager Sean Schraus, City Attorney Palmer Davis, Finance Director Mike Brosart, City Treasurer Jeff Stearns, and City Clerk Kelly Coos were also present. Commissioner McLeod called the meeting to order at 8.15 a.m. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss and gain approval to proceed with the planned series 2021 Energy System Revenue Bonds for the purpose of financing new projects for Lakeland Electric. The Finance Department and Lakeland Electric are seeking permission to issue $165 million of Energy System Revenue Bonds for the purpose of funding certain long-term capital projects. Projects to be funded include $145 million for the purchase and installation of six new rice engines, which will add 120 megawatts of generating capacity, $12 million for the construction of the Hamilton substation in Southwest Lakeland, $5 million for a hot gas path upgrade for the MGT2 unit, and $3 million for miscellaneous production projects. Bonds are secured by pledge of Lakeland Electric revenues. Lakeland Electric bonds are rated in the AA category by Moody's, S&P, and Fitch. Bonds will be underwritten and sold by Citigroup with Wells Fargo and Bank of America acting as co-managers. Expected all-in interest cost is expected to be less than 3%. Bonds are expected to be priced on or about December 1st with a final closing on December 15th. Action. Mayor Bill Mutz moved to approve issuing the bonds. Commissioner McLeod seconded, and the motion carried unanimously. The meeting adjourned at 8.24 a.m. All right. Is there a motion to approve? Motion so to approve. And second. And a second. All right. And discussion by commissioners. Uh, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. I thought it would be good for someone from Lakeland Electric just to walk us through uh, as I have explained this to people, I get questions, what are rice engines? I know we have talked about this a lot and we're very familiar with what it is that we're financing, how we're, uh, what we're buying, what we're doing, but just if we could have kind of a big picture overview of uh, what the rice engines are, what they do, uh, the, the capacity that we're replacing, the timeline, et cetera. I think you're Can we have somebody from- Yeah, that's you. Quit turning. Keep <laughs> 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 looking. Our guy. Yeah. Every night <laughs> Scott Bishop, man, manager of um, emerging technology. So a rice engine is similar to that on a cruise ship. Um, long stage, multi-cylinder, fast starting, capable, versatile engine that they're going to we're going to stack in um, combination that allows for high energy efficiency, um, good throughput, good M MBTU output, and then those in congruency create a lot of megawatts. So we're it's a cruise ship engine used as a um, electric energy generator, right? So you take the output of it, instead of pushing a cruise ship, you're pushing energy on the grid. That energy is used for lights and air conditioning and all that. Powered by? Powered by? Powered by, in this case, natural gas with a 20% capability of doing hydrogen in the near future. So that gives us flexibility forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Scott, can you remind us of the timeline of when these, when we expect to have them, install them, and have them online? So they're in the in the process now. Um, I think it's a t late 23. 
Um, could be early 24. Okay. So wait, it, it takes a minute to put all that stuff together, so. Okay, thank you. I think it's good to keep this out in front of people. I know we have talked about it so much, it's old news, but I still, as, as I talk to people, I'm sure my colleagues as well, they're folks who don't, understandably, it's, it's difficult to know what is this and what are we replacing and when does it, how does it work, when does it happen, so thank you. So it creates 120 megawatts of power and they are uh, loaded as you need them and they are, uh, they produce electricity in about two seconds. So it doesn't take long as opposed to three days in our coal plant to come up to speed in terms of the heat uh, before you can really open them up and produce it. So um, very, very flexible, very heavy, 137,000 pounds an engine and there's six of them in series. So you build the building, leave the end open and then a crane brings them in one at a time and sets them and you close the end of the building in. And so uh, it will be a very interesting process to watch in construction as well. And Stephanie Madden, uh, or Commissioner Madden, do you have any comments on the rice engines? No, but when Commissioner McLeod doesn't, says that people are unfamiliar, I think all of my children think everyone knows all about this because they hear their mom talk about it all the time. Yes. But it's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. It's very exciting. Uh, it should be noted too that there's a, uh, on the uh, rating, it's gonna be S&P and Fitch and not Moody's in this, that saves us about half a million dollars over the term of the rating of the bond period, uh, not to have included Moody's and S&P and Fitch are highly accepted. So that was a decision as well in this and we appreciate that uh, Mr. Stern's leadership in that regard. Any other uh, uh, comments by the commissioners? Any comments or questions by the public? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same, unanimously passes. Thank you so much, Commissioner McLeod, for your report. And that brings us to the consent agenda. And those items are marked by an asterisk in the, if there's a motion to approve. Move to approve. Thank you, sir. And a second. And a discussion by commissioners. Any discussion or questions by the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. Now, now we have a request to appear from the general public. We have Chuck McDonald, uh, interim president and CEO of Lakeland Chamber of Commerce regarding the Lakeland Chamber Foundation development and disposition agreement inspection period extension, a contract we already <coughs> have in place, an agreement we already have in place. Mr. McDonald, how are you? Good morning, commissioners. I appreciate you putting us on the agenda morning. this morning. Uh, after the exciting presentation from the hospital and, and that award, this will probably be the dullest thing. Uh, this morning, but it'll be brief, so there's a trade-off. Uh, the Chamber has been working on building a facility for us to conduct a lot of uh, workforce education and training, and it's been going on for a couple of years, and, and we just hit a little bit of a pause during the COVID time to slow down some of what we're doing, and the agreement that we have with the city has some timelines in it, so I think you all got a letter in your materials of, of a request that we extend this for a year, and I, as a city manager, I believe he briefed on Friday. Um, so we're requesting that year and a waiver of the $10,000 deposit. So what this does is takes the existing um, agreement and adds a 12 month extension to it into the inspection period, buying you some organizational time yes, to continue the project full steam ahead. Absolutely. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. And a second. A discussion by commissioners. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Interim President. And I, I'm glad to know that even with uh, the movement that you have a foot to have the uh, works, as we call it, come, come about and come out of the ground, that it will continue and uh, make sure that it gets done and, of course, em embrace all the things that you will share with us, you know, from the previous, uh, I guess, uh, um, uh, president and, and, and board. And I'm glad just to know that it will continue. It will still be one of the things that you will work on to make sure it happens. And I'm glad to know that uh, you step in some shoes to make sure it gets done as well. And if you need the extension, of course, what we're hoping to approve here very soon, very shortly here, uh, that will help you make you know, things happen and come about. Thank you, Commissioner Walker. And just to let the commission know, we are full steam ahead at this. And uh, we have a new foundation executive director, Connie Bamberg, and she's leading the charge on this, and we're excited to have her on board to make that happen. Thank Excellent. you. Any other uh, comments by commissioners? Any from the audience or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. You have that 12 month extension, and that we have no equalization hearing board meeting, and that brings us to public hearings, item 3A1. And our city attorney Davis will cover that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have uh, several ordinances for second reading and consideration of adoption this morning. 
First is proposed ordinance number 21-051, an ordinance relating to local government comprehensive planning, making findings, providing for small-scale amendment uh, number LUS 21-002 to a certain portion of the future land use map of the Lakeland Comprehensive Plan, our community 2030, changing the future land use designation, for, uh, designation from convenience center to, to uh, conservation on approximately 8.23 acres and from residential low to convenience center on approximately 6.29 acres of property located north of the Polk Parkway, east of Airport Road, and south of Steeplechase Drive, provided for severability, provided an effective date. Move to approve. Second. Motion to approve in a second. Discussion by commissioners. Hearing none, we talked about this a lot. Oh, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to ask Chuck Barnby, you said on Friday, you, you pointed out that this change actually has less of an impact on traffic and Airport Road than the original um, zoning agreement a development agreement. I just want you to say that again and just reiterate that for us. Um, good morning. For the record, Chuck Barnby, Community and Economic Development. Um, because with this land use change, we'll, we will actually uh, end up with about two acres less of commercial than what exists today. It will, by default, result in a lower trip generation. So, uh, you know, we still have to go through the formal concurrency determination process at the time of site plan submittal. But from a land use perspective, this will have a smaller amount of commercial than what exists today. So uh, we see that as an overall positive for, for traffic in that, in that airport road corridor. Thank Appreciate you, you bringing yeah. that up. Yeah, I just think that's a good point to highlight as we um, move through this. Thank you. Any other comments by commissioners? Any comments or questions by the audience at all? Seeing none, uh, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Unanimously passes. Next is proposed ordinance number 21-052, an ordinance relating to zoning, making findings, providing for a change in zoning classification from limited development to plan unit developments on approximately 6.29 acres located north of the Polk Parkway, east of Airport Road, and south of, of Steeplechase Drive, providing conditions, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Move to approve. Second. So there's a motion to approve and a second discussion by commissioners for questions. Any discussions or questions from the audience? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner McLeod? Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Unanimously passes. Number three. Number three is proposed ordinance number 21-053, an ordinance relating to zoning, making findings, providing for a change in zoning from RA4, single family residential, to 01, low impact office, on approximately 0.24 acres located at 103 West 7th Street. Providing conditions, uh, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Move for approval. Second. Motion to approve in the second. Any discussion by commissioners? Questions? Commissioner Walker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I thought I saw Mr. Drum go. He didn't know this, but he's left. was in here, but he's not. Uh, maybe Mr. Uh, Brian Ruiz can answer. I, I'm trying to, it's off, has to do, I guess, with this particular uh, matter, but of course, there's a property that's adjacent to what we've been hearing about. Do you have any idea where we are with that particular property called Maggie's, uh, Muffins, Maggie's, whatever? You're asking about Mary's Bagels? Mary's, okay. Mary's bagels, yeah. I knew it was an M. <laughs> you didn't get your breakfast. Yeah. No, I don't. I didn't have breakfast now. <laughs> yes, Mary's. So, so what's the question? Is that this is adjacent to, right? Correct. This is across the improved alley immediately south of the Mary's Bagels property. And Mary Bagels is where, in this scheme of things, are we at a point? Are they still going through its process? They've been approved for CRA assistance and close to approval of their site plan. They have it submitted for building permit approval that I'm aware of. Uh, we had to work through a number of access issues with DOT, uh, interconnectivity between this southern site and the Mary's Bagel site mm -hmm. uh, to make both of them work. Uh, but that's a part of what led to the request from the CRA to rezone this parcel. Yes, yes, okay. All right, thank you. I want to make sure I had in my thoughts. Yes, sir. Appreciate it, sir. Any other comments or questions by the commission? Any by the audience? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. <clears throat> Unanimously passes as well. Uh, last ordinance for second reading is proposed ordinance number 21-054, an ordinance relating to zoning, providing for plain unit development zoning on approximately 10.45 acres located west of Airport Road, south of the Polk Parkway, and north of Carolyn Boulevard to allow for a 148-bed assisted living facility, providing conditions, finding conformity with the conference of plan, providing an effective date. Moved to approve. Second. 
Motion to approve in a second. A discussion by commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Music. Yeah, I think so. I think I have a question. I just want to pull down. This was the parcel that does not have access through. That was the, that's the mm -hmm. parcel that does not have access through Carolina Lakes. Right. So they have to okay. come from Airport Road. Right. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? There it is. Uh, question. Any questions or uh, comments from the audience? Seeing none, Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Uh, unanimously passes. Thank you very much. That We have no community redevelopment agency report, and that brings us to 5A from our city manager, Strauss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for, uh, five items for presentation this morning, and then I do have a couple of, uh, of verbals uh, at the end, uh, if the commission will allow. Um, the first item that we have is uh, regarding a, a renewal of the city's long-term disability coverage. Uh, the city's current uh, contract for long-term disability coverage is due for renewal on December 31st, 2021. Long-term disability insurance protects an employee's family income in the event that they are unable to work after a six-month waiting period related to a disability. The long-term disability uh, benefit covers all full and part-time regular employees who may be injured or have a serious illness. We're at the end of a three-year rate guarantee with our uh, current provider. The renewal they offered to the city to hold to the current rate was to uh, either add an additional benefit or accept a rate increase per employee per month for every $100 of payroll. Uh, the increase would equate to a 17.62% increase in the premium. Uh, risk management requested that our broker, Gallagher Benefit Services, would market the coverage to seek competitive pricing. They did, and they provided uh, six carrier options for review. Those have been included to the commission uh, in the agenda item. And as you will find, uh, VOYA was the lowest uh, annual cost. And so it is recommended that the city commission authorize the appropriate city officials to contract the long-term disability coverage with VOYA. It would be effective January 1st, 2022. It would have a three-year rate guarantee, and it would have an approximate total annual expense of $229,349. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Commissioner Walker and seconded by? Second. Yeah, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you for our bookend approval. <laughs> uh, discussion by commissioners. Any by the audience? Seeing, seeing and hearing none, uh, this is a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passed. Item B. Item B is a recommendation regarding renewal of the city's uh, health plans, stop loss reinsurance coverage. VOYA is the city's current carrier for the city's health plan, stop loss reinsurance coverage. The current contract is due for renewal on December 31st, 2021. <coughs> stop loss reinsurance provides reimbursement to the city on any single health claim that exceeds $435,000 in the calendar year. Um, a summary of the claims versus the premium paid over the past two years, as well as year to date for the current 2021 period has been provided to the commission in the agenda item. VOYA has proposed a 7% increase to the current rate at $35.04 per member per month with an enrollment of approximately 2,600 employees and retirees on the plan for an annual premium of $1,093,248. It's recommended that the com City Commission authorize the appropriate city officials to renew the stop loss coverage with VOYA effective January 1, 2022 as presented. Um, and is there a motion for approval? Move so, approval. Second. Uh, Commissioner uh, Music and then seconded by Commissioner McCarley and discussion by commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Music. And I apologize, it might be here, I'm trying to read it. Is this a yearly contract? How often is this contract? Well, I'll ask uh, Ms. Diaz to answer that. It doesn't refer to the term. Good morning, yeah. Joyce Dias, Risk Management and Purchasing Director. It is an annual contract where we go out and market it, the broker does each year to make sure that we get the best market price for the coverage. So how, how I mean, if it being a yearly contract and with as, as vast as the employees are and the, the needs and things, when do you start that process to be able to make sure you get those responses back? And is a year pretty typical? Every year is different. Um, we're seeing a big n growth in the numbers of claims that have exceeded the stop loss amount. 
So this year, for whatever reason, we have quite a few. It tends to cycle that way. But we'll start looking about August, September time frame. And sometimes what the stop loss carriers will do is they'll ask to see the claims, say, through the end of September. So then we're kind of on hold waiting for them to respond back based on those numbers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? <clears throat> Any questions by the audience or comments? Seeing none, uh, this is a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. The next item is a recommendation regarding the city's on site employee wellness clinic management services. Healthstat Wellness doing business as Everside Health is the city's current on site employee wellness clinic management contract. The Healthstat Clinic was established in 2007 as one of the first on site employee wellness clinics in the state of Florida. The current contract has been an automatic renewal each year. However, to ensure the best market pricing for uh, the city, risk management and purchasing uh, took the opportunity to review an RFP that was put out by Polk County to ensure that we were receiving uh, competitive uh, pricing and services. Uh, the city uh, does utilize our uh, health stat employee wellness clinic for various things things such as pre-employment physicals, our drug-free workplace uh, program, workers' compensation injury care. We do have an on-site uh, physical uh, therapy clinic there, which assists when we do have um, workers' compensation type injuries in the workplace. There's also disease management programs that are included. And uh, we even have a registered dietitian nutritionist that's available through those services. The HealthStat on-site clinic has provided a validated return on investment which has consistently increased year over year. Our active employee population has a 97% utilization rate, which is well above the 80% benchmark that the provider uh, seeks uh, to accomplish. Um, new services uh, will allow uh, the, the uh, clinic to focus on uh, patient care. There will be virtual and telephone options available for those services. All other expenses will be passed through expenses with no markup to the city. It's recommended that the city commission authorize the appropriate city officials to negotiate a contract for the on-site employee wellness clinic services with HealthStat uh, Wellness that would become effective January 1st, 2022. And again, is also based on the RFP review uh, that Polk County put out for their uh, services. That completes presentation. Move approval. Motion to approve second. and a second by Commissioner Madden. Uh, discussion by commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Reed. What are, what is our present cost per year? Do you know what, do we know what our cost is per year right now? It's approximately a million dollars a year. And it varies depending on utilization of the clinic and the types of services that we provide. And how many employees would you, is that about 2,800 employees, 97% of that amount or what? It's around 1,900. 1,900 utilize it? So it's mostly those on the health plan or um, injured at work employees. So we have around 2,000 full-time employees. So majority of our employees are able to utilize that clinic. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Any from the public or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those same, unanimously passes as well. Thank you. Thank you. Before the next item, Mr. Mayor, just like to, um, for the public and, and for the commission, um, the health stat services is a, is a tremendous benefit here at yes. the city. Um, we see a lot of our employees who have on the job injuries uh, return to work quicker because those services are available and the ability to access those here in the workplace um, also certainly helps us keep uh, our health insurance costs down. So uh, it's, a, it's a great benefit and has worked well as the utilization rate demonstrates in the agenda item. Excellent. The next item uh, that I have for presentation is regarding a recommendation for task authorization with Geosyntec Consultants for Stormwater Best Management Practices Design Manual. The Lakes and Stormwater Division sought a proposal from Geosyntec Consultants, a professional lakes and watershed management services firm currently under continuing contract with the city to develop a stormwater best management uh, practices design manual. The manual will be used to identify the most appropriate best management practices for stormwater management designs, aspects of future development and redevelopment within the city. The ultimate goal of the stormwater design manual will be to implement new practices supported by city code that will reduce the discharge and pollutants and stormwater runoff resulting from new development 
and redevelopment uh, areas. The manual will include uh, practices uh, and new technology such as low impact development and green uh, infrastructure processes. Um, these uh, strategies will assist the city in areas developed prior to stormwater regulations and anticipation of increased growth. A scope of work uh, for the design manual has been uh, included as part of the task authorization and in the agenda item provided to uh, the commission. Funding for the stormwater best management practice design manual in an amount not to exceed $180,301.04 is provided in the fiscal year 2022 stormwater utility CIP. It's recommended that the city commission authorize the appropriate city officials to execute execute a task authorization with Geosyntec Consultant for Stormwater Best Management Practices Design Manual as presented in the amount not to exceed $180,301.04. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve in a second. And Commissioner Music has a question. So what are we using currently before this was being developed? What is our best practices? I'll ask uh, Lori Smith to address uh, the questions from the commission. We've had an engineering, but not best practices. Okay. Good morning. For the record, Lori Smith, manager of Lakes and Stormwater Division. Um, we currently rely on things like the environmental resource permit and construction general permits that are, um, are given to contractors, developers through SWIFTMUD and DEP, uh, respectively. Um, which outline their need to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, those are uh, supposed to be uh, uh, produced by the contractor, kept on site. They're never submitted to the regulatory agency for approval, and they're very generic and difficult to enforce. Um, we have issues as, um, as the city when we go to commercial sites that are being developed and we have a lot of sediment leaving the sites, mm -hmm. impacting our storm, <clears throat> excuse me, our stormwater systems and then eventually our lakes. So this gives us the opportunity to actually put it in our city code that it'll be required for any development redevelopment site and it gives us the ability to also enforce that. Right now we don't have the enforcement measure <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, Commissioner McLeod and then Commissioner Reed. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Laura, you may have said this on Friday, but what's the timeline for developing this manual and for us having it? And then a second question, do you expect those, the, the recommendations, the policy changes, will it be significant if things that we don't have in place now? I know you mentioned the enforcement, but just trying I to get a sense for that. Thank you, good question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, I think it will be very significant and useful. Um, our time frame with our task author authorization is to have the manual put together um, in a draft form by the end of next year. Um, and then we would also look at stakeholders to give us some comments, including the commission. Um, and and um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? I think you answered both, was, okay. uh, yeah, you, you covered both of them. Thank okay, you. thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Reed, yes. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. You, you answered some questions for me Friday, which I thought were most beneficial. Um, will this have any impact on our, our, on our uh, lakes that we presently have? Or is this going to be kind of encompassing everything or just going to be new development um, from that standpoint? It'll be new development and redevelopment of, of uh, currently developed properties. So as you know, we're, we're pretty urbanized and a big part of the city. And a lot of those properties were developed before there were stormwater regulations. So when that goes into redevelopment, our goal is to incorporate these stormwater pollution prevention control measures or BMPs on these sites. And because we're such an urban area and there isn't a footprint to put other things like a stormwater pond on some of these sites, Incorporating that low impact development and green infrastructure will help to, um, to, to treat that stormwater before it's released off the site into our stormwater drainage. And as you know, all of our stormwater drainage eventually ends up in one of our lakes. So by preventing pollution from uh, leaving sites and getting into stormwater, it eventually helps us to restore our lakes to the water quality that we wanna see. So that's the ultimate goal is to preserve our stormwater um, systems and, um, and, and, and get our lakes back to the quality that they were prior to development. 
So hopefully this will identify deficiencies we have in our current system into our lakes within the city limits. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anybody in the public? Uh, this is a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. We'll look forward to getting that produced. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then item E, sir. Uh, the final item is uh, regarding a task authorization with uh, PGA LLC to provide professional municipal engineering services for the Five Points Roundabout project. The Five Points intersection is currently signal signalized and located at the crossroads of Sloan Avenue, West Central Avenue, West Main Street, and Lake Beulah Drive. This intersection has complex, complex geometrical features and signal operations, but serves to provide critical access to Bonnet Springs Park and RP Funding Center facilities. The city's Public Works Department and Community Redevelopment Agency conducted a feasibility study in 2018 to determine if a single lane roundabout could reduce intersection delay and improve roadway safety while serving as a gateway to the downtown west area. The study concluded traffic operations and safety could be greatly enhanced through the implementation of a roundabout. Public Works has implemented the first phase of the study recommendations by eliminating the fifth leg of the intersection or the connection of Lake Beulah Drive near the West Main Street. Public Works also prepared roundabout concept plans before soliciting a proposal from Patel Green and Associates to provide project design through the city's continuing contract for professional municipal engineering services. The services authorized within the task authorization are proposed at a not to exceed amount of $225,000 and a scope of work uh, has been prepared and is included in the agenda analysis to the commission. Funding for the design of the roundabout project is identified and provided for within the fiscal year 2022 transportation fund. It's recommended that the city commission authorize the appropriate city officials to execute the task authorization for the five points roundabout project as presented. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Commissioner Reed, and then second, second by Commissioner Walker. And discussion by commissioners. Can, can we put this yeah. uh, put on the screen so our general public sure. can uh, see what, what we're discussing three. and what uh, may be forthcoming? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Commissioner Walker. And in addition to what Commissioner Reed is asking, I think it should also uh, try to explain the changes that came about because it's been, what, three years now? Uh, since we even talked about the roundabout and due, due to the pandemic, of course, and changes that come about, we should make sure they understand what's about to happen now once it's, it's approved by us. Chuck, if you go to the agenda item, you can pull it up. There we go, upside down, but otherwise good. <laughs> it depends go. where you're standing. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, my name is Ryan Lazenby. I'm with the Public Works Engineering Division. As uh, the city manager indicated, we began with a feasibility study in 2018, just to look at the feasibility because of the roundabout, this has always been a relatively complicated <laughs> intersection. And it's because of the geometry that exists in the intersection, it has to run in what we call split phase, which means you can only let one leg go at a time. So the average uh, cycle time is 170 seconds. Uh, the max cycle time during peak time is 220 seconds long, over <clears throat> three and a half minutes. The roundabout analysis indicates the average delay time during those peak hours is reduced to nine seconds from three and a half minutes to nine seconds, which is critically important as the, as the Bonnet Springs Park develops right now during that PM peak hour, traffic actually backs up going southbound from Sloan Avenue onto George Jenkins Boulevard. So what we did is we started with that in 28, 2018. One of the recommendations that came out of that was to eliminate the fifth leg of the roundabout. So if you look at the picture above, you can see a concrete cul-de-sac. That was our first step. So Public Works did that about a year or two ago with in-house de design and with in-house uh, construction forces, and we got that out of the way, which further increases the efficiency of the roundabout. And then after that, we were like, okay, it works from a traffic operation standpoint. We've done the traffic modeling. Now let's see, because it's a very tight corridor, we've got the bridge on the, on the north side of it, and we've got the lake on the 
south side of it and all the spider wet intersection coming in. Can we feasibly do this with, with the geometry? So we moved to the next step was to move forward with actually what we call a performance check plans where we look at fastest path vehicle swept analysis to make sure we can get the vehicles we're anticipating through the intersection and we determined that. And that's where we got to here. So we're, we're at that point, we're ready to move forward with full design, which we're uh, looking at about a six month design window. All right, technically making it four points a day, coming from music. <laughs> so is the, is the main reason to develop this just because of the complication of it? I mean, or it is the traffic, it's a combination. I mean, what's the, what's the real impetus? I mean, I used to have an office right over there and the, the, the traffic wasn't unbearable. So I'm just curious what was the original. So the, the traffic, it, it is level of service asked for a failing intersection today during the okay. PM peak hour. And uh, Ch Chuck, if you could flip that back to the previous page, it shows a little bit more. Let's zoom out. Yeah. Let's zoom out. Um, so you can see the roundabout there on the north side of the lake, but that distance between George Jenkins Boulevard, which is on the north side of the bridge to the roundabout, is only about 360 feet. And currently, without even the park open, that thing backs up during the PM peak hour. And we've asked DOT to start to look at alternatives to improve the intersection for the park access. And one of those that was being kicked around was a roundabout, which cannot be done unless we clear out this intersection first and it remove that backup. Paul, you've got another question, I can see it. Yeah, go ahead. So, and I know that, that we don't, that we don't, you know, have any power over the railroad itself, but that is certainly an issue. How are we? <laughs> so I mean, we've, you know, so, you know, we've got, you know, we got two things we're going to work on here, but we still got the. So, so Chuck and I have had some preliminary discussions because we're going to need some help on that one. That's a big dollar item with DOT about one. One of the critical items for us is to get a pedestrian access across to the park one day, pedestrian bicycle access. But we've also had some preliminary discussions with them about the the bridge itself and the railroad, because it, it's got um, some issues. For instance, the standard vertical vertical height you want of clearance is 16 feet minimum, that one's 14 and a half. The lane widths are, you really want a shoulder, you know, or a thing, they're right on top of each other. In fact, there's a crash cushion on that bridge and it gets hit a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. So we are having those discussions, but that's a, a long term. <laughs> And we would do this independent of them. That's correct. This right. right. Yes. But yes, you are absolutely right. Other comments by commissioners, Commissioner Matt. Yes. So I'm hoping um, that we're, you know, looking at things like Elon Musk third generation boring technology, things that are going to create a tunnel a lot cheaper and expedite this access to the park, um, and not just wait on F. DOT to come up with how to figure out how to move the railroad. So um, this is a really big, big problem to me. I think that everyone in the city, you know, maybe, you know, only went through that bridge unless if they had to for work. But with the park there, that is our access to the park for that entire neighborhood. I mean, that entire, and so to me, however we can prioritize this, you know, be a squeaky wheel, whatever, figure out new technology. I mean, this cannot wait. I mean, if we have a failing intersection now and we don't have that park open, I mean, have we done a traffic study on, on what we think about people going to the park from that direction? And then also <coughs> certainly with the pedestrian bike is a must to be able to get to that park. Um, and, and for the record, Chuck Barmy with Community and Economic mm -hmm. Development, as part of the Bonnet Springs uh, Development Review, um, the applicant did develop a traffic study for the, uh, for the entire site through build out. And so from a level of service standpoint, really all that was needed at George Jenkins Boulevard were some signal modifications and the addition of a, of a westbound right turn lane because we do have some right of way constraints there. There was really the inability to extend that eastbound left. And so one of the things that in working with DOT and the applicant that we put in um, was the, uh, the need for an event management plan, which is very similar to what we required with Southeastern University in their new stadium because of the unique characteristics of that park, there are going to be times where we may need 
uh, law enforcement. We may need some other type of traffic control to be able to handle that inbound outbound. But ultimately, um, a roundabout or something more substantial is, is, is going to be needed at that intersection. Well, and I am serious about the, the tunneling construction question. So I'd love to hear if that, if, I mean, are we not doing much of that in Florida? We're too shallow with our, or is that a possibility? Well, are people looking towards more tunneling when you have an urban, you know, landscape to be able to provide transportation? Well, one of the good things that we received from DOT, and this was a few years ago, the previous district rail administrator provided us with a design, uh, design plans and national construction details for a very similar location right next to DOT's headquarters in Tallahassee. Uh, it was about an eight foot wide trail. It was almost a culvert underneath the rail line itself. The rail line was up above grade. And so DOT was confident that's something that we can do uh, very similar to here. Um, that recommendation was included in the Polk Rail study that was approved about 10 years ago. And this has been kind of an ongoing request that we've had with the district pretty much ever since. We did this past year get that uh, location on the official TPO priority list. And I think that's something that as we start getting towards um, next winter and into spring when the priorities are reestablished again, that's yeah, an opportunity for the, for the commission and the, and the city as a whole to demonstrate the, the need for that, um, that, that pedestrian facility to be constructed and prioritized and actually programmed the DOT work program. The dollar amount we saw was about a million and a half dollars. So as everything goes and, and given what DOT is adding to the work program now, a million and a half is nothing compared to the hundreds of millions that DOT is adding on other projects that never went through the DOT pro or the uh, TPO prioritization process. So that's something I think we can use to, to keep, get some momentum going on this. Uh, Commissioner Walker. I think, you know, Mr. Mayor, I thank you again that many of us forget because I guess history. Um, when the Moorhead, the African American community was imploded, the only way we, we could traverse and get to Moorhead, you had to go over. But of course, now you see it's, it's tunneled. So that was many years ago when that happened. But uh, I, I can agree with you, uh, my dear colleague. That was something that you know we did back then. Mm -hmm. So it can be done because I can remember as a young lad growing up, the only way I got into Moorhead was I had to go across the road that we see now, could we call Sykes Boulevard and all that? Mm -hmm. That became what we, we have now after that community was imploded. So we know it can happen. It's the cost that can be involved in doing it. Oh, Commissioner Music, do you have another question? Yeah, I just had a question because I, I because of history and not being in that area, is is there a lot of foot traffic now? We did a count. Yeah, there's foot traffic, back traffic. A couple of years ago, in anticipation of this becoming a higher priority, uh, traffic city traffic operations for a week uh, period had a video camera trained on this on this intersection, and they were counting about 60 plus pedestrians and bicyclists a day going through this going through this tunnel. And so um, that really demonstrated a very high demand because if folks are, are using it today as dangerous as it, is as it really right. is, um, imagine if you have a, have a, and that's before the park even opens, the demand is only gonna increase from there. And so there, there's definitely some, some, some demand that's been documented by the city. Commissioner Music. Well, just to follow up on that, and so, so we're envisioning that when the park is completed, more people are going to ride their bike there. Is that what we're saying? Sure. So I, I'm, I'm just, again, I don't live in this area, but where are these bicyclists coming from? There's a school, Blake's there, the whole neighborhoods. I mean, it's a huge neighborhood. And you have, you have, if you come up Lake you have, Hunter. You have the Twin Lakes. Yeah. The new, uh, the last yeah, our new housing authority. Housing. Uh, okay. you'd, go, you'd go right by Blake to, to yeah. get there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Commissioner McCarley. And this, just for Commissioner Music's, standpoint and kind of explaining this will also help us with our connectivity that we have talked about how parts of our northwest district have been um kind of cut Separate, up no, separated <laughs> yeah with big roads like when you look at kathleen and sykes coming down that's a major thoroughfare as well as george Shingles boulevard so to get more people connected not only with vehicle traffic but with multimodal transportation it's really important to do this. And I don't know if you all talked about this, but if you want to talk about that roundabout on the north side too, that's going to help filter into the park and also, and George Jenkins, just so you know, that street 
is a failing road as well because it's so narrow. It's sort of like South Florida was through Dixieland. It's, you know, well, you've driven it. I mean, there's no buffer on either side. There's no median in the center. So until it opens up at Strain or like our Brunel Park Parkway, it's pretty treacherous for about a mile in there. It'd be the way you drive to the park, Mike. Yeah. House. Okay, thank yeah. you. Can I can clarify one thing? Chuck uh, mentioned a tunnel would be about uh, a million and a half. That is for just pedestrian bicycle. He indicated an eight foot wide thing, right. eight foot wide tunnel. It'd be significantly more to do vehicles oh, and there's more complications because we have to address that vertical clearance issue where you could put it basically at grade with a pedestrian one, but we'd have to go into the ground a couple feet for uh, vehicular traffic, mm -hmm. and there is a very substantial gas line in that area that we'd have to deal with. Of course there is. Right. Of course there is. are always down there. <clears throat> well, and the safety that would come, so yeah. sa leave the bridge as is, the safety that would come by taking the pedestrian yes. and bicycle traffic okay. off of there is going gotcha. to be dramatic. Yeah. For it, because so many people are going to go to the park that way. That's what we want to have happen. And um, uh, so it becomes, that tunnel becomes very, very important. the hotels, you know, just the hotel guests going through there to get to the park. connection too. Right. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments by commissioners? Any other comments by the audience at all? Thank you very much for those amplifications. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I may, for just yes, a couple of, of verbals. Uh, just real quickly for the um, commission's uh, uh, knowledge, I uh, wanted to update you. We have uh, now received our first transfer of funds per the agreement that we have with our Summit Broadband Partners. Uh, that was uh, achieved and the city received those funds per the agreement. We've also been talking with Summit and will soon be scheduling an update uh, to the commission. Good. There's been a lot of technical work that's been going on, on behind the scenes. Um, I believe they have uh, signed on some customers, but they've also, uh, Summit has indicated that they're really to, uh, ready to start um, uh, unrolling their marketing uh, campaign and, and planning. And of course, we will partner with them on that. So uh, before much longer, we'll have an update uh, with our Summit partners here to provide you with more detail on that. Great. But uh, happy to receive those transfer of funds and, and the partnerships working out well. We, we're, we're excited to see more and more opportunities out in the community. Um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, announce is tonight is the Build It Roundtable yep. uh, that we've all been uh, waiting uh, for and, and was delayed uh, because of COVID. So our Community and Economic uh, Development Department uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 will be having the Build It Roundtable at the Magnolia Building. And as we've talked about before, this is our opportunity to sit down with our customers, uh, a lot of the contractors that work in construction who uh, submit plans and pull permits uh, from our uh, department. Um, this will be an opportunity for us to sit down and listen to them and uh, find out where there are some complications that uh, we can work toward improving. So that's tonight from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Magnolia Building. Thank you. Excellent, sir. Thank you very much. All right, um, that is the end of our city manager section and that takes us back to our city attorney 6a or i'm sorry 6b1 6b1 is proposed resolution number uh 21-083 a resolution relating to transportation making findings approving and authorizing the mayor to execute a locally funded uh, agreement between the state of florida department of transportation and, and the city of lakeland for a trade park uh, boulevard alternative corridor evaluation providing an effective date move to approve second motion to approve in a second discussion by commissioners Seeing none, any discussion by the audience or questions, comments? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 Yes? Aye. Yes. Aye. All right, unanimously passes. Okay, uh, under miscellaneous, we have a construct, uh, construction task authorization with Kaminga and Rudvitz uh, for construction services for the English Oaks Force Main Phase 3, Section 4 project, which is a, an ex, uh, installation of a 16 inch uh, PVC Force Main along airport road from approximately the Carolyn Boulevard entrance uh, down to uh, Drainfield, Bull, uh, Drainfield Road. This is designed to increase the capacity in that area, particularly the, the existing Polk Parkway force main. Uh, purchasing issued an invitation to bid for this project and received three bids. Uh, Kamingan and Rudvitz out of Tampa was the low bidder at $1,087,680. 
Killebrew Inc. out of Lakeland uh, was the second lowest bidder at $1,096,750, which is approximately $9,000 more, which would normally implicate our local preference ordinance. Uh, in this case, the ordinance does not apply, however, because we are using state funds through the uh, state revolving uh, loan fund program. Uh, so we cannot apply a local preference to this project. Uh, so uh, the uh, convenient rivets bid, uh, bid was evaluated by uh, the city staff as well as Shafts and Skillman and determined to be a responsible, responsive bid and also the lowest bid. So it is staff's recommendation to award the construction tax authorization for this project to Comingian and Rivets in the amount of $1,087,680. Move for approval. Second. Second. Motion approved in a racing second. <laughs> and every one of those you want, Ms. Goose. Um, a discussion by the commission. Commission Reed. Can we have a drawing put up so people in the audience that are yes. or on TV can see what we're discussing, please? So that would be page three on the agenda item of this. Or this wonderful sheet of paper that you could just lay. <coughs> there you go. So Carolyn Lakes and Publix are at the top of that line, section A. And that's Carolyn Lakes. And then down to just north of the airport on Drainfield Road. So that's that section four. And that'll be done in 2022. Can, can you please elaborate and give us a brief dissertation on this, please, sir? Sure, Robbie Kness, engineering manager for water utilities. So the English Oaks project has been a long running project. The biggest piece of it was to get the big line all the way out to Glendale. We've had two phases recently that are for more localized improvements. Um, back in October, I brought you section three that was on the other side of Hardin Boulevard. Um, this section runs down Airport Road. And really it was conceived to help provide that capacity further out the parkway near County Line Road. So this particular piece will um, construct the line. So it runs from the parkway down to Carillon Lakes and generally everything flows out the parkway now. We will redirect that flow down to Drainfield Road and anything else in the area, and we'll decide what kind of changes we want to make, adjust any valves or anything to, to redirect flow. But we're going to try and get more flow in this line flowing south to Drainfield Road, and that will reduce the, I guess, existing capacity on the parkway to allow for future development to come in for anything that runs further out towards County Line Road. Because right now, the only way to service those areas is to come down the parkway. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. I mean, it's a it's a route. We're just making changes to get that capacity back, if you will. And you might speak to the English Oaks capacity, too. So the just generally speaking, we run a 30 inch line from about the airport all the way back to, to Glendale. I, I did some quick numbers the other day. An easy way to think of it is flow based and that line can run about 15,000 gallons per minute. And right now there's only about 2,000 gallons a minute. Now, most of that has been kind of earmarked for Southwest Lakeland. We've, I've tried to be kind of careful and not let just any adjustments and changes be made. We might have some tight areas. If we all go jumping into that 30 inch line before you know it, it's at capacity. And then we're going across town and taking another 15 years to make this all happen again. So we're, we're very picky and choosy with what we're doing. But right now, Southwest Lakeland's positioned very well for capacity. Great. Uh, Commissioner Reed. Is this going to be, is this gravity or force main? What is it? This is going to be a force main. So the other thing, whenever we make changes, it's not easy just to connect the pipes because there's numerous pump stations all over the place. And just because they can flow into the pipe <laughs> doesn't mean that they'll flow all that way. These pumps might start to challenge each other. So anytime we do make any changes, and this particular piece of the project is just kind of building the road, just the, the pipe, the conduit to get it down to Drainfield Road, in order to make any changes, we always have to go verify the pump station is capable of doing it and then maybe make some changes if that's necessary. So yes, this is just a force main. Okay, uh, any other comments by commissioners? Anybody that <coughs> answer questions? Seeing none, this is a uh, roll call vote as well. 
Voice vote. Uh, I'm sorry, voice vote. Voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All the same, unanimously passes. Thank you. I believe that takes us down to uh, resolutions under utility, um, which is a resolution related to the finance committee item uh, that uh, you heard the minutes uh, for earlier in the meeting. Uh, that is proposed resolution number 21-084, a resolution authorizing the issuance of Steve Lakeman Florida Energy System Revenue Bonds Series 2021 and one or more series, in an aggregate uh, principal amount not to exceed $165 million to finance the acquisition of power generators to be located at the C.D. McIntosh Jr. Power Plant and all the costs of installation improvements and equipment related thereto and other capital for the city's electric system to the extent provided herein, <coughs> fund reserves, if any, and to pay the costs of issuance related to such 2021 bonds, providing for certain terms of the 2021 bonds, establishing a form of the 2021 bonds, authorizing the mayor or such other officer and clerk to approve, execute, and deliver on behalf of the city a, a registrar and paying agent agreement and appointing the Bank of New York Mellon Trust Company, N.A., as registrar and paying agent for the 2021 bonds, authorizing the mayor or such other uh, authorized officer on behalf of the city to approve the form of a preliminary official statement with respect to the 2021 bonds and to deem said preliminary official statement final for purposes of, of SEC rule 15C2-12 and authorize the mayor or such other authorized officer and the clerk to execute and deliver on behalf of the city an official statement uh, authorizing the mayor or such other officer, uh, other uh, authorized officer uh, with the advice of the city's financial advisor to establish the principal amount, the interest rates, redemption terms, and maturity schedule of the 2021 bonds within certain parameters to award the sale of the 2021 bonds to the underwriters described herein on a negotiated basis and establish the conditions to such sale approving the, the uh, form of a bond purchase agreement, authorizing the mayor, such other authorized officer, and the clerk to approve, execute, and deliver on behalf of the city a continuing disclosure agreement with respect to the 2021 bonds and approving Digital Assurance Corporation, LLC, as disclosure or dissemination agent thereunder, authorizing uh, certain city officials to take actions deemed necessary or advisable in connection with any of the foregoing, providing for other matters relating thereto and providing an effective date. Move approval. Motion to approve and a second from second. Commissioner Madden. Uh, this is a $10 million lower than we had originally proposed it, and that was because of the movement of the uh, gas line north of 33, which we took out of it and figured to be able to phase that in at a later time as those expansions take place um, at, out of the oper operating capital budget at that time. Uh, so that m makes the cost less as we go forward. These are for the projects that we're just trying to accomplished to make the earlier mentioned items happen. Uh, so any discussion or questions by the commissioners? Any questions or comments from the audience? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. All, we'll start with Commissioner McLeod. Aye. Yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Unanimously passes. And I'm going to circulate a certificate uh, uh, relating to uh, the Sunshine Law and conflict of interest that you have to sign as part of this bond issue, uh, just signifying that you haven't uh, violated the Sunshine Law and discussions relating to this issue, and also that you don't have a financial conflict of interest with any of the uh, underwriters uh, for this, this uh, uh, bond issue, which are Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. So I just need you to each sign that and return it back this way. Very good. Um, that brings us to C1. C1 is an agreement with Oracle America uh, for uh, an upgrade to the city's uh, meter data management uh, application. Uh, the current uh, application uh, will no longer be supported uh, as of March of 2022. Uh, so what, what we're doing now is, 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 is going with Oracle's transition to the cloud for purposes of, of, of this uh, function. Um, Oracle was deemed to be the sole source, uh, sole source provider of this of this service because they only, only they have the ability to retain our historical data at least at a at a reasonable cost. Uh, so, uh, what we're recommending is that you enter into this agreement with Oracle America uh, uh, to, uh, for their new uh, data management uh, meter data management system. It is a uh, five year agreement uh, beginning in January of 2022. Uh, the total cost of the agreement over the five years is $1,873,411.60. That will be paid quarterly uh, starting with the third quarter of FY 2022. Uh, the 2022 amount will be $187,314. 
and then future amounts will be uh, uh, budgeted uh, in, in future fiscal years. That's recommended for your approval. We have uh, Scott Bishop and uh, James Moore in the audience if you have any technical, technical questions about this. Move for approval. Second. Motion to approve in a second and discussion by commissioners or questions. Uh, coming from music. I just wouldn't mind if they came and came, kind of gave us an overview only because this is outside of my privy and most people on the planet. So if they can <laughs> just give us a nickel tour of what this really means and, and why we have changes have it, yeah. and why, why we even need it. Yeah. I'd be happy to. I'm James Moore, Lakeland Electric's marketing systems manager. Uh, this application replaces our current MDM. Oracle Utilities is the uh, incumbent with this application. This is the system of record for all the uh, smart meter data. So all of the, uh, your, your, the, the customer service billing is served by this and also the customer web portal. So uh, the customers are able to uh, log in and see their, uh, their historical usage using this data. So uh, those, that's the important, those are the important parts of it uh, for customer facing. We also use it uh, internally for uh, things like engineering, uh, where we need uh, fine-grained data. Okay. Uh, just, just to follow up on that, so does, does Oracle own the data, which is why we have to stick with them, or it's just because of the contract, how we would get to it is a kind of a pain? Excellent question. Uh, no, sir, we, uh, we own the data. We own all of our data. We keep, that's, that's per contract. Um, the, the reason for the, the continuity, the data continuity, is it's stored in a proprietary uh, manner. So uh, included in the, in the contract is uh, continuing access to the, the old version of the, uh, our, our current version of the Oracle MDM. So we can continue to use that as long as we want to, want to access that data. Um, uh, what it does is it saves us having to transition that data to another data model, which would be exceedingly expensive. So obviously the efficiency in continuing with this, but economically it makes sense as well. I mean, they're, yes. they're, this program or whatever is not outside of the realm. They don't feel that they've got us in a triangle hold, so they're charging us whatever. Correct. Okay. Uh, we, we, we have done some comparisons there, and it, they're, they're, it's very, very much in line. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions, <coughs> uh, Commissioners? Commissioner Madden. Thank you. So does Oracle provide for the security of the data too, or is that another? Yes, that's one of the, the, the key advantages of moving this workload to the cloud. Um, Oracle, of course, with, with their investment, uh, they, uh, they are with us. They, they join with us, and, and of course, they also have an interest in securing our data because of their reputation. So uh, their reputation is on the line with uh, keeping our data secure. Okay. Right, any other comments? Any from the audience? Yes, come on down, please. State your name and address, please. My name is Kevin Williams. Well, you have to do it, I'm sorry, in front of the mics, Kevin. It's okay, I, I, didn't, I don't want to hold anything up. <laughs> Listen, um, I used to work for Microsoft Bing. I've worked directly with Oracle. Um, before, it, honestly, you will benefit to make your own platform and get away from Oracle, so you can encrypt it yourself, because you're you have the information of every single citizen in that data, and now you're putting it up to the cloud, which is then being able to be accessed worldwide. Um, I used to deal with fraud in other countries. You're not going in the right direction. It's not, go, uh, go to your local schools, go to the programs, and try to find a better way than using such a public thing so widely known and practiced um, in many different platforms. Um, find a way to encrypt the city's data. And the best way to do it, to replace Oracle by going to the schools to build a program. It won't cost much. You guys can open up a conversation with different tech programs, SAU, whatever program it is. I mean, this might be a temporary thing, but it's not as safe as he's saying it is. 
I would look, I would recommend looking into this further before making that step. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from anyone in the public? <clears throat> okay, seeing none, this is a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. Item two. Uh, the final item on the agenda is an agreement with, uh, I'm sorry, it's a, a um, get to my place here. <clears throat> It is an agreement with um, uh, Florida Municipal Power Authority for them to release their capacity in the Transco pipeline to the city of Lakeland uh, in the amount of 5,800 MMBTUs. Uh, the city uh, is interested in, in doing this for two purposes. One, just to diversify the, the pipelines that we are relying on to, uh, to obtain our uh, natural gas for operating our power plants. And the second reason for this is that we have a, an agreement with the city of Leesburg to purchase 5,800 MMBTUs of natural gas at a, at a discounted rate, uh, a favorable rate, and need this additional capacity in the Transco pipeline uh, to facilitate that transaction. Uh, under this agreement, uh, we would be pur purchasing FMPA's capacity in the Transco pipeline through April 30th of 2026. Uh, and the total cost of that purchase of their capacity would be uh, $208,059 per year uh, for a total cost of $917,739 uh, through April 30th of 2026. Uh, this would be funded uh, through an appropriation in Lake Electric's fuel budget uh, that will be presented to the City Commission in August of 2022. That's recommended for your approval. Motion to approve. Move approval. Second. And a second. Discussion by Commissioners. Any discussion by the audience? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, same. Unanimously passes. Uh, that takes us to the end of our uh, meeting, and it, with the exception of two other matters. And then uh, the first is audience comments. So anyone in the audience who would like to speak on anything as limited to five minutes, just state your name and address and come forward, please. Come on down. <laughs> Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Good My morning. name is Katie Burns and I live here in Lakeland and I'd like to continue to speak for the unborn. Psalm 139. <clears throat> Our Father says he knows us as we were formed in the womb. And if he knows that that's life, I think that's enough for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burns. Anyone else? Hello, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jerry Kimmel. I live here in North Lakeland, have since 1984, so I consider myself a law abiding, tax paying citizen. Hopefully, hopefully an asset to the city. Um, I was going to try to explain the whole meaning of life to you in three or four minutes, but I don't know if I have time for that. So uh, I wanted to just talk for a minute about Solomon who was considered to be the wisest and richest man who ever lived. And uh, you've all heard of Solomon. Uh, long story short, he, he had more money than he knew what to do with. He had more wives and concubines, 600 of them, that you would ever want to have. Uh, I don't know how in the world he ever did that. But in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he said, this is right at the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, which he wrote, this is over 3,000 years ago, the wisest man who ever lived said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So he had it all, but it was, it was never enough. He realized at the end of his life, it was all going to be left behind him for the next guy to come along. So why, 
Why are we here today? Why is everybody in this room here today? Well, we value life. We value the life of every man, woman, boy, and girl in this city. Uh, we feel we make a difference. We feel our lives are valuable. What we think, what we say has meaning, has value. Uh, it's, it's not insignificant that we, we meet and talk. Uh, my fa the favorite speaker that I ever used to listen to, uh, Ravi Zacharias, would say, he, he, he came up with this, I don't know if you call it an algorithm, but he said there's, f there's four things that all men seek in this life. And these four things are origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Uh, I first heard him say that when I was driving down the road and I almost drove off the road trying to find something to write with so I would not forget what he just said. It was so profound. There's four things that all of us are seeking in this life. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. You know, origin. Who am I? How did I get here? Meaning, you know, what is life, what is life about? You know, is all we do, is all we're doing is living and dying and then that's it? Is there more to life than that? Morality, what is truth? What is the ultimate absolute? What is true? And then finally, destiny. What happens when we die? Is there something that happens when we die? Uh, well, the Bible, according to the Bible, there, there's, a, there's three words in the Bible that are very, almost scary, if, you, if you've never heard them before. <coughs> Hebrews 9.27 says, For it is appointed unto men once to die. Then the next three words, it says, but after that, judgment. the judgment. So there is something that happens after we live and die and, and we are gone from this earth. After that, there is eternity forever out there. And so we want to we wanna know that we're going to be standing before God. You know, God is going to be the judge of all of us. And we have to stand before him one day and give an account of what we've done in this life. I have some quotes from some great men, and I'll tr I think we need to hear what great men think. I think if we think what we have to say is important, let's see what some of these great men had to say. Okay, here we go. Noah Webster, and I'll be quick. Noah Webster said, great authorities are great arguments. I'm just going to start quoting, and then I'll tell you who said it. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. George Washington. It, it, the Bible, is the rock on which our republic rests. Andrew Jackson, seventh president. Take all of this book, talking about the Bible, that you can by reason and the balance by faith, and you will live and die a better man. It is the best book which God has ever given to man. Abraham Lincoln, 16th president. I'm going to skip a few. Oh, I want to go down to this one because this one was so good. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 32nd president, said, The influence of the scriptures in the early days of the Republic were plainly revealed in the writing and thinking of the men who made this nation possible. They found in the scriptures that which shaped their course and determined their action. And that's what should, should shape and determine our course and action. Thank you, Mr. Kimmel, very much. Any others from the audience? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Eileen Swiler, and I would like to speak in opposition to the previously commented upon abortion ban in Lakeland. Though I do not live in the city of Lakeland per, per se, I live in Lakeland and the majority of my life, including purchasing and health care, is in the city of Lakeland. <coughs> and we have lived in Lakeland since 1993. And I believe that once a woman has made the decision that she needs to have an abortion that is a private health care decision, between her, her health care provider, and her God. Like anyone, her decision to a private, safe, legal, and local health care, including abortion, are paramount. 
Another person's religious beliefs should have no impact, much less eliminate her health care choices. She needs to have the ability to act on her health care decision to a safe abortion in the city of Lakeland where she lives, protected and I understand and support that everyone has a right to his, her, or their religious beliefs and how they live their lives. I vehemently believe that this stops at the rights and beliefs of another person in the autonomy of another person's right, especially a woman in her reproductive rights to private and safe health care, including her constitutional right to an abortion. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the city commission and thank you. And, and I request that you dismiss the previously called for religiously imposed ban on the right to women's reproductive health care in the city of Lakeland, especially an abortion ban on women of diverse religious beliefs in the city of Lakeland. Thank you for your time, courtesy, and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Hiller. Any other speakers? taxpayer as well and a resident here. I wasn't going to say anything today until I heard the CEO from Lakeland Regional Health come up here and what she had to say and the vision that they have in the, in the city of Lakeland, health care, the medical students coming in and everything that would make Lakeland the greatest place that we need to have a hospital like that and especially with the competition that's pro popping up everywhere else. So that made me think of what these people are saying about the abortion situation. Lakeland Regional Health does not perform abortions. They've opened up a beautiful pavilion there for, for actually for fetal care for babies that are in trouble to save them and to help them. So I was wondering why they're, on the contrary, down the other end of the Florida, South Florida Avenue, there's that situation going on. Why can't we hook up with Lakeland Regional Health and go forward and make it a sanctuary city and help babies instead of ridding of them? Other, if the mothers want to have an abortion, let them. I don't know what else to tell you, but Lakeland should be on the same page. Okay. Thank you. Come on down front, please. Yes, this is a different topic. That's fine. That's going to be the same topic. Um, I was originally with. No, no, I, I, I meant a different topic than your earlier comments. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's make all your comments from the podium. No, um, I was not preparing for that, but it's a different topic now. <laughs> Well, okay, but back to what I was going to say. I emailed you guys with three suggestions um, last Monday because I wasn't sure if, it, if I had it on time. And I'm going to pull that email up. It's been saved on my phone right here. Um, okay, the first suggestion is um, going to be taken into consideration of the heartbeat law. Texas adopted this, other cities are working on this, and, uh, and six other states. It's not imposing on what this lady is saying, making the decision. <clears throat> it's saying when the baby has a heartbeat, we're not gonna stop that heartbeat. <clears throat> um, that's like six weeks. I heard this, her statement is saying, saying stop an abortion 100%, and I would love that, but it's not opposing what she's saying at all. I do live in the state. I do live in the city. City, city uh, limits. We have many churches. Probably we have more churches than most other cities. And I think there's a strong sense. If you were to want to each church, tens of thousands of people would say, totally get rid of abortions. All right. So <clears throat> that leads me to the second one. So the heartbeat law. Looking to that, I did. I did go ahead and forge you the bill that's already been made into law in Texas. So this is not new. <clears throat> so the next one is, we want to put up an ordinance that says, if somebody infringes on my rights 
or somebody tries to coerce my sister or somebody to get them into a room, and they do this a lot, and they tell them false information. They bully, they bully them in some sense. They say, oh, how are you going to afford this baby? How are you going to do this? How are you do that? They're not telling them ways to afford the baby. They're, t they're putting the pressure on them when there is a father and a mother involved in every single birth. And <clears throat> the father's rights are overlooked by far and his, his religious beliefs as well. So I want to put, I want to do a mandate that pretty much clarifies that you're allowed to sue a clinic or a person that harms your baby and tries to coerce the mother and let the judge decide how that lawsuit comes out. I think that's simple. Um, that's that because it's infringing on your First Amendment rights as a, as a Christian or as a somebody that practices Hinduism, Muslim, or like most religions are against this. <coughs> The third one um, is clarifying the uh, what is it, executive order put to us by our, by our president that's currently in action and basically saying we have a right to pray in public property, public spaces. I, it's, I did put the PDF there. You don't have to research it. You just got to click these PDFs. These are all things already established by our government. I would like you guys to adopt these things. So if I'm in front of an abortion clinic and, so, and I see somebody walking in, I can ask them, hey, would you like to pray? Or I can have a shirt on that says, hey, I'm not boycotting ab abortions, but just saying, you know, <coughs> style Christianity. Or hey, or just saying, would you like me to pray for you? If your mind is set up to go to that operation and to kill off your child, I'm gonna pray that hopefully you change your mind or at least God would protect you and your child. So I don't think we should stop people from praying on the sidewalk regardless of where it's at or any public space as there's amendment, sorry, there's a uh, presidential mandate um, already sent to you in your email. It's already in action. <coughs> All three of these things are bills, uh, executive orders, and the First Amendment infringement that I want to, to say, and and you have it, I already emailed it to you. I think this is the easy, the three easy decisions that might be controversial, and I know you guys like to, not to vote, in the opposite way of each other. But don't think about what the committee thinks. Think about what you think. What you think is right. That's it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Anybody <coughs> any other comments? All right, seeing none, that ends our um, audience portion. That brings us to item 10, Mayor and members of the City Commission. We have, uh, this is our responsibility annually to establish the compensation of both the City Manager and the City Attorney. We had some discussion on this in our agenda study, and so is there a motion. Motion to approve. Second. And, now, and as, as done we, in the agenda study yeah, at those the amount we set in the agenda study, yes. Okay. Do we need to share that amount? I think we should. Yeah. That'd be great. That's yeah. where I was going. Okay, yes. well, go ahead, Commissioner McLeod. Well, I was going to have you. I All right. Not have <laughs> you uh, to do. I can go off memory, but that may or may not benefit the mayor, uh, okay. the city manager, and attorney. So our our um, uh, opportunity and <laughs> discussion on this topic was to take the city manager, whose pay had been raised from earlier when, from the interim position, uh, to the appropriate level and apply the percent and a half and to an. Um, the one and a half, two and a half, right. uh, which is our cost of living and merit increase uh, to that, which would raise him from um, 196 to 203,840. And to take the city attorney who had worked as a city attorney and then assistant city attorney and then became a, the interim city attorney. And at that point in time, we gave him a 10% increment pay increase based on his prior compensation, but not an adjustment to the full uh, amount of pay that was provided. Our former city attorney final pay prior to this was $222,000. Uh, his current, this would be for uh, Mr. Davis, his current compensation is $165,000. So we would make an incremental increase uh, to bring him up to really a little slightly under market, 
but appropriate, much more appropriate in terms of pay to um, of twenty five thousand dollars from the one sixty five to take him to one hundred and ninety thousand mm dollars. -hmm. So that was the proposal. Mm -hmm. So these two individuals sitting at the end of the bench, which is slightly embarrassing for them to sit there during this discussion, but that's the nature of the beast. Uh, if, Commissioner Music. Yeah, and if we could um, add to that, that this comes off the heels of us just finishing up our yes. um, review of both of them. So, um, and you know, you, somebody could talk a little bit about the results of that and, and how well we thought that they were doing, which, but. Um, yes, go ahead, Commissioner McLeod. And I can speak to that, Commissioner Music. I was just going to say thank you, Palmer and HR, for sending yes. uh, the data on other cities and counties and compensation for city attorneys. That was helpful, and it was very much as you said, Mayor, that it was we're competitive, we're not at the top end, we're not at the low end, and so that was helpful to have that context. But I do think, speaking to uh, that significant bump for our city attorney, um, Commissioner Music, you and I were not in the decision to put him in as interim or to right. Um, put him in as the city, the permanent city attorney, but I think Palmer's done an exceptional job. I think it's very well deserved, the increase in compensation. We want to be competitive. We look at the number of issues that, as a city, we have dealt with the past year and a half, and Palmer and his legal team and, and are a huge part of keeping the city running seamlessly, and so I 100% I support it. And with respect to our city manager, we had a uh, very positive review uh, with respect to um, Changes both have identified areas, both positions have identified areas of improvement, which we, that's what an effective review <coughs> provides for. Uh, but that would give him the full benefit of the two and a half percent merit increase as well in our consideration. Uh, Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make sure that we, do we need uh, the motion that I made to show the effective date? Oh, very good, which would be retro back, retro back to, to October 1. October 1, yes. correct. Yes, it should, should say that. Okay. I make that amendment then. Thank you. And I second it. Excellent. <laughs> Any other discussion? Any discussion or questions by the audience? Comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All the same, unanimously passes. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you both very much. Look at those smiles. <laughs> Just, stop talking about it. Move on to something else. Yeah, talk about something else. <laughs> but they're both buying lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that brings us to um, any comments by any members of the City Commission. Who would like to begin today? Commissioner Madden. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> not another boring Excuse comment. Me. Right. Maybe not a boring comment. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but maybe a technology. Right. So, um, I did want to just say that um, I'm so happy that my colleagues and I are have the privilege of serving for another um, term, and that they. I wondered if they had a good weekend, not having to campaign this past weekend. Uh, that probably seemed a little boring. Oh, uh, very good. After, very nice. After being on the road, um, a little musky. <laughs> so. Um, and also just about this job, you know, it's interesting to watch the debates and all the things that come up. I never dreamed that when I first came into office, the big issue at hand would be, you know, moving the Confederate monument. Uh, honestly, I, I am one who didn't know that it was a Confederate monument. I am ashamed to say that I, I didn't really even know about the monument until uh, the debate ensued. And so certainly we all scrambled to get up to speed and learn our history and to hear from citizens and to... Um, figure out what we were going to do. And I, 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 for one, was up at night, you know, thinking about this from every angle, from my son who graduated from West Point, um, you know, who might serve and die in, an, in a very unpopular war, but I would hope he could, you know, be remembered for his sacrifice. And a daughter at Ole Miss at the time who didn't want them, you know, her school didn't want to take away <laughs> Ole Reb uh, as their ma mascot. And they really were boycotting black bears um, becoming the mascot. So. Um, you know, but not being a southerner myself, you know, moving here when I was 15. Um, so just really trying to take in that really controversial and very uh, viscerally held issue for so many folks, either whose history had already been erased that I learned, um, you know, the folks in the African American community who they already, you know, had history erased for them, and then those who did not want, you know, the Confederacy. Um, to be erased um, or just only be disparaged in a certain light. And so that was just a huge issue, you know, coming in as a new city commissioner that I didn't anticipate when most of our issues are budget, you know, or new developments. Um, but then there are things like, you know, talking to people, you know, about a local vendor preference 
and you hear from this one or that one who misses an opportunity to do business with the city and they want to do business with the city and they want to learn how and so you have a policy workshop and you be able to and you're able to talk with your colleagues and um, you know kind of see what maybe you can do as a city and three years later you know a little over three years later you have a local vendor preference so nothing comes fast you know then there's things like a group of citizens came to me and said uh, we'd like clay courts you know uh, we have to drive to Auburndale or to other cities to use clay courts and so you bring it up to your peers at a strategic planning retreat and you know you voted down four to two commissioner troller was my buddy on that one um or you you care about broadband and you actually believe that things that we are taking for granted now like telework and telehealth are going to be something that we are going to need ubiquitous full capacity great speed broadband in the city of lakeland to do business going forward and the COVID has since proved that but your colleagues don't think that it necessarily should become a utility that you add to Lakeland Electric, even though you've been providing great service and a dividend for 100 years. So you go into a P3, you know, and you f find a partner who wants to lease your dark fiber, and three and a half years later, you have a P3 deal. I bring all of this up to say that I was um, profoundly moved when the pastor came several uh, meetings ago and asked about a sanctuary city. And I was intrigued with the idea that we could even do something like that. And then, you know, certainly you hear about Texas heartbeat bill and, and things like that and think, you know, why, why are the states kind of taking a different approach right now? And I would argue that it's not a solely religious issue at all. I would say really it's science and technology that's caused more people to think of it, not just a lump of cells like we may have back when we talked about Roe v. Wade when it was first in its in, in our need that it really was health care for the women. But now that we see in a 3D ultrasound how much of like a person that little fetus looks and when they are able to survive outside the womb earlier and earlier, I think people's minds are changing on this issue. Maybe just like people's minds changed on slavery or on, you know, uh, moving a Confederate monument. And so I don't think it's something that we should not discuss. I think it's something, I didn't know we'd discuss any of the things that I talked about, but I think it's a, an intriguing and interesting idea. Um, you know, there's prohibition. There's times in history where we think alcohol is fine, and then there's other times where we think alcohol is not so fine. Um, so I'd be curious to see, you know, what my colleagues think about, you know, having some opportunity to talk about and debate this issue, see what our citizens think about this issue. I do know that I've asked personally for our city attorney to look at the ordinances in Texas. Um, it seems like, you know, with Roe v. Wade being kind of like the federal law of the land and a lot of people saying that abortion is a constitutional right, it, that is, I guess, the nuance that's making folks have to like go against an abortion provider, you know, because then that would be the person who's breaking the law with regard to that city or that state, not at, go against the woman who has been pregnant or has had the abortion, just providers of abortion. But it seems it's still a slippery slope, kind of tricky. Uh, obviously, not that many people have done it. It looks fraught with, you know, complexities um, and legal ramifications, but most things do have complexities and most things do have obstacles and so i just wanted to for one say that i'm game for the conversation i do think that it is a person um, inside the body so it's not the woman's health care actually and abortion is not health care at all it's 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 a, a unique person inside of a person i've had seven such persons inside of me um, and i you know uh, one of them ended in miscarriage and six of them are you know a, Five of them are adults living their own lives separate from me now. But I do feel like that it's interesting to me to see that citizens are coming. Maybe citizens are awakening. Maybe the country is moving towards a different view than it's held before. Um, and I really do, like I want to say, reemphasize, I don't think this is a religious debate that can't be debated in City Hall. I think it's really more based on science and technology that's evolved to let us see things um, from a different perspective. So I did want to just say that um, because we have had every meeting, some folks come and bring that to our attention and to give you an update that our city attorney is doing some research. And um, I'm going to be doing some research, just like I've done research on broadband and clean energy and small modular nuclear reactors and anything else that um, I have citizens come to me, even clay courts, uh, come and talk to me about. So if you're interested in this subject, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about it. Citizens, you can email me. Thank you, Commissioner Madden. Mm -hmm. Commissioner McLeod. <laughs> 
Well, I was, along those lines, I was going to ask our city attorney to share a legal perspective. Commissioner Madden, while I am strongly and passionately pro-life, I think there are legal considerations and things that if a city goes down this road, mm -hmm. um, when this issue is being discussed currently and debated uh, at the Supreme Court level, I think the ramifications, and, and uh, I would like Palmer just to speak to that, and that should be part of the discussion for sure. Okay, sure, certainly. <clears throat> I mean, there, there's obviously the merits of the issue that we can debate. Uh, I think the focus for this body should be the role of local government in the issue. And regardless of how you feel about the underlying issue, currently abortion, uh, at least at, at certain stages, is a lawful procedure. Uh, that's received protection from the Supreme Court. It's also recognized in Florida statutes and by uh, the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, so that, that is the, the blunt fact that, you, that you're, you're up against is, is that, that it is a lawful procedure in the state of Florida. So to ban uh, an existing abortion clinic would, I think, immediately result in a, in a, a petition for a, a, a temporary emergency injection and, and, a, and a permanent injection. And, and the way that the law is right now, I would not think that you would succeed in that ban. Uh, so uh, that, that uh, there, as, as uh, Commissioner McLeod alluded to, there's a lot going on at the national level. The, 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 the Texas heartbeat law is, is making its way to the Supreme Court. The Mississippi law on, on viability is also scheduled for, I think, oral arguments uh, December 1st or early December. Um, so there's a lot in flux at the federal level and, and, and at the state level as well. But the, 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 the question is, what role can a city commission, a city government play in that issue? And, and I, I don't think that you're in the strongest position uh, uh, to address that issue. I think that is, is something that needs to occur at the state and federal level. So are strip clubs legal? How do we do? How the, the statement was made that we've banned those adult use establishments in the city, and that's not entirely accurate. Um, we have separation requirements for adult use establishments similar to the, the separation requirements we have for bars and nightclubs. And, and to establish those types of, of restrictions, you, you need a factual basis for that. I mean, you need to be able to show that there's some kind of externality that's affecting the surrounding area uh, in order to support an ordinance such as that. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I guess I've been waiting for this opportunity. So, Mr. Commissioner Madden, bringing the subject matter up, being a pro-life person myself, you know, I, I have to make sure that um, I understand, as Commissioner McLeod alluded to, and our city attorney as well, where is the role of local government in all of this? When we have this particular subject that's being faced here in our country, on national level, and our state, on state level, where does we, as a local representatives of the elected, offic le elected officials for our city, where do we, where do we lie? And where, what rights or what do we have to go along to support what has been asked on both sides? So I'm glad to hear that because I was, I was gonna suggest we have a workshop to make sure since we've had many of those <clears throat> come before us in the last few weeks of our uh, commission meetings, to ask about doing this, as well as asking us not to do it, where do we lie? Where do we have? What do we have? So I'm glad we, that discussion has come about because of that. And if I hear correct, then you know I'm not going to put our city into a situation where we may find ourselves. See, many of us went through the situation somewhat with, this, with the monuments, you know, and I think it's a different subject. Of course, I know, very much so. Uh, and I don't want to find ourselves. You know, here we are having to debate and not have significant, um, I guess, law or whatever uh, to stand on to do anything at all as a, as a municipal government. And that's where, I, that's where I stand, even though being a pro-lifer, that's where I stand still, because I'm still an elected official to serve all people. And you said some, uh, Commissioner Mann, that I think we, I think it's so important that we kind of make sure that we understand too, not about so much the abortion, uh, not the abortion or abortion uh, subject matter, but just making sure we have a city that we want to make sure all are included. You know, we, I think sometimes we forget about that. We, we, that's part of our city, um, what we call those uh, 
stay in, what you call it? The um, um, bar, Excuse me, Ms. Mayor? person Yeah, it's part, part, part of what we call slice. Is it called slice? Yes. 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 So we we want to make sure we're, we, we, we're inclusive in, in every area we can, but still, you know, when it comes to certain uh, laws and certain uh, statutes, we got to make sure we uh, are guided by those things as well. And I appreciate you bringing that particular subject up, uh, Commissioner Madden, but also I appreciate what the attorney is saying because we did make sure we're not overstepping something that could cause a challenge for us even later until we can have some of the, I guess you call the federal level, making some whatever guess, guess the decision would be as this thing move forward. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time, I'm sure, to even do what, you know, what's been asked on a federal level. Will you not say so, Mr. City Attorney? Certainly. I mean, the, the, the issue is before coming before the Supreme Court, yes. but uh, you know, I, I have no idea how that's going to turn out. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I, I, that's, I'm, again, I'm glad to have the, the, the open discussion. And we want to have had uh, maybe suggested a, uh, a workshop where, where the discussion would, would have been even more timely to be able to talk and discuss from all seven of us, along with our city attorney. Uh, but if that's the time right now, that's why I'm sharing what I'm sharing. So in summary on this topic, <laughs> um, uh, we are blessed to serve with a commission that is strongly pro-life. Um, but we are not wanting to race against what we know are existing laws that protect the rights of exactly. citizens to make decisions, even when we think those citizen choices are very, very costly, but they're legal, uh, uh, they're legal today. So for us to engage in this effectively, we probably want to rely a lot on what we see happen uh, legislatively right. and with judicially with respect to support before we would want to move forward. And maybe the best pause we should do is wait until we have some court tested actions that provide some confidence in terms of direction and that you let us know when and if you see those things occur uh, in the future where it would be applicable within the state. Because I don't think there's an issue with respect to the desire to protect life uh, on this commission, but it's the appropriateness in our role in terms of the timing and the ability to enforce it. It's, uh, certainly there's plenty going on at the judicial level and, and the issue is a little bit different in the state of Florida as well in that we have a, a, a separate explicit uh, right to privacy clause in our Constitution that's not in the U.S. Constitution that the Florida Supreme Court has relied on and it's in, in its abortion decisions in the past and there's also state legislation so it's not just at the federal level but uh, you know there, there are things at the state level as well that we are limited by so I, I just don't know that at the local government level, you're in the position to make those kind of decisions given constraints at the federal and state level. Gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, yes, go ahead. Well, I would just say I think that principle of when there are state and federal laws, although we may personally not agree with them as, lo as a local elected body, that restraint to not pass a local law that conflicts with that, I think that principle, everyone would want us to protect that because there may be an issue where you're on the other side of it. Yes. So for us sure. to to exercise that, that restraint, that respect for those laws, even though maybe we disagree with them. Commissioner Reed. Thank you. Again, I hadn't planned on saying much this uh, morning. Uh, I, I normally don't, didn't have any civic notices or anything going on today that I wanted to address. <clears throat> but there again, uh, to bring up what Stephanie said, uh, I've, been, I've been asked by the public you know, because of the different uh, comes up, has come up with city commission in the past. And I told him, I said, I didn't think we really had an appetite to address this issue because we do have a law of the land, which is a Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. and, and there again, we can't step on other people's. There's 50% 50, there's 50 one way and 50% another. And from my standpoint, of course, there again, there again, in my opinion, it falls right in line with our, with our gun ownership legalization to carry carry a, a, a firearm in a voter, I mean, vaccine mandates, which is a, a big one with me. Uh, and then of course we have voters rights and legalization of marijuana and face masks, all the different issues that we have that, that have been pretty much precluded and decided uh, for us. And there again, we don't have necessarily, to, we can, some minor things we can change, but there again, this is something that's a, a, 
on a grander scale that we can do on a microscopic level. And so they're getting us, I really don't have an appetite to address these issues until it's changed by the Supreme Court. And I don't think anything we did would, would preclude that. That's, that's so there, yeah. the, the strength is that the, if it's tested at the state level, yes. with a lot of uh, unanimity with legislatively in that, uh, then that becomes an opportunity to uh, see it pass. And so we should work on the legal changes uh, at, the at the most influentially possible appropriate levels. Mm -hmm. um, if we were asking you for where that is, what would your comment be? Ask me for what? But where, where is the arena in which we, if there are citizens that want to work towards this end, Where's the arena in which the laws ought to be changed? Well, nothing can change until the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, addresses the issue and and, and, and decides which way that goes. And, and depending on how that goes, then things may or may not open up at the state level. But uh, you know, we're you know, a couple steps removed from that. Two steps back, anyway. Okay. Any, yes. Anything I, else? I was going to mention. I think we we probably aware there is there is a bill being pushed on the state level right now. Anyway. We know there's one that's out there uh, very similar to what has happened in Texas. The heartbeat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although Texas does say that it was the grassroots getting ordinances in the cities that gave them the resolve and, you know, the appetite to move at the state level. They felt like the uh, grassroots was strategic to, to get that going. and influential. So nice that there is something that can test it and that there will be a decision made about it. And the Supreme Court has decided to consider it. So they will be taken it up. Yeah, they'll just, be taken up. Yes. Just a comment. I don't have the appetite really until mm -hmm. we know from the Supreme sure. Court level how to push this forward. I think we need to stay in our lane. And I think that single issue voters and single issue minded discussions really cause a ripple effect in all the other day to day parameters that we should be working within as far as land use and other things that we really can control and that we really do have purview over and responsibility too. So I think sometimes whether you agree or disagree in this topic, you can get hijacked very mm -hmm. easily into a social issue that would preclude us from getting our day to day work finished. And I think that's for me personally until something changes on a federal level that I, I, I think we need to stay with our day to day work. And not because we don't have a desire to protect life. Right. Right. That has nothing. Really yeah. For, for me as a commissioner, that has nothing to do with that. Okay. Good. Good discussion. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes. I love the fact that this is a fearless commission. <laughs> All right. A other comments? Yes, Commissioner Walker. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, and oh, <laughs> hard to I believe. I won't see it? you all, I guess, until after Thanksgiving. Oh, Christmas. Just kidding. <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> you throw me away to Christmas. No, I'm just kidding. No way. <laughs> no, but happy Thanksgiving to each and every one of you, and of course, all of our citizens here in Lakeland. Have a blessed Thanksgiving. Thank you very and much. And we uh, hope you all have time with family, which is so important. And I think, you know, we'll probably see more of us doing a little more festive stuff this time around, this year than we did last year, maybe, okay. because of situations that we dealt with a little more last year. But I want to make sure you all know that and enjoy your time with your family. So Thank important. Thank you, sir. Anything else? All right. If there's no objection, we're adjourned. Thank you. Oh no, thank you. I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good. I'll be good. I'll be good. I'll be good.